Hello. So today we've got uh, Luke Bernard, the Executive Director of uh, Voices of the Garden, uh, the creative mind behind uh, our game, The Light and the Darkness, that uh, explores the Holocaust in a narrative setting. Uh, so we're really excited to talk to, to Luke and about his project, uh, the experience of making that project, um, and the passion behind it. So Luke, glad to have you here today. Oh, glad to be on. So you've been in games for quite some time, since I understand around 2008. Um, how did you kind of get into that world of, of designing and developing games? Well, it's because I, even if I sound British, I'm actually French. So born in France, but based in England. And then when I was 10, went back to France. And in, in France, pretty much when I was like around 16, so as a teenager, I kind of lived in the middle of nowhere, basically the countryside mm -hmm. and a really poor area too. Mm -hmm. So there was kind of just nothing to do. And I basically kind of learned how to make games kind of on my own, pretty much mm -hmm. via forums and things like that. And so I didn't go to school for it or anything. So I actually got kicked out of high school twice. Uh, very mm -hmm. hard thing to do in France too. <laughs> so, so yeah, that's pretty much how I got started making games and then i just i released my first game which was honestly quite bad it wasn't a good game but i was mm -hmm. you know i was super young it was my first one and that kind of uh with the money made from it, it allowed me to move to the u.s and yep. kind of start um basically you know do, doing my own thing pretty much being an independent game director yeah i mean i think there's something in you know coming from small towns um, I come from a small town in Australia where there are very few people. And, you know, the talent, I think, when you have, when you're really, really bored and you, mm -hmm. you look at things and you, and you have that desire to learn, do you think that affected your um, somewhat independent um, and, and personal approach to, to game making and creativity? Well, well, I think growing up poor, when you, when you grow up poor mm -hmm. too, you kind of want to make your way out of it so you kind of you can't rely on anyone you can't so it kind of nearly makes you more motivated it does because mm -hmm. like say for example i've noticed one thing when i hire people that come from universities they're often the worst and i have to let them go after a couple months but all the self-taught mm -hmm. people i've just stayed with them like for years and decades so yeah that's what i think i think self-learning and actually being hungry and actually not coming from a privileged background mm -hmm. actually does kind of help you kind of do more more things creatively. Yeah, I mean, I think we there's I think you know, the idea of formal education is you get a, a standardized set of knowledge that an industry can understand and a standardized expectation of what you can and can't do. But when you're self-taught, you're really doing something because of the the passion and the and the drive um, to want to know how to do something. Um, I mean, your your projects, I've kind of had a look at a few of them. Um, you've, you've done some works for animal treatment. I think it was like, was it Kitten Island? Yeah, Kitten Squad. I did something with Peter, Kitten the Squad. Animal Rights Group, because, uh, so, so Peter or Peta, I don't know how you, how you pronounce mm -hmm. them. Um, no, no matter how people feel about them, right? Mm -hmm. You know, as they like them or not. They're still one yeah. of the most effective and successful nonprofits. And they kind of understood that video games were kind of like one of the next realms, kind of, you know, kind of spread their message in. And mm -hmm. that's why I'm actually funny if I'm actually making another game with them. I am. Mm -hmm. But uh, exactly. pretty much it's actually been super successful. It's one of their biggest campaigns and it actually worked. Mm -hmm. It did. So that, that's why I guess I do love uh, Peter's Animal Rights Group just because they do try new things. They manage to get their yeah. message across. And working with them, too, as a nonprofit, they actually really know what, what they're doing. I think they, they're an example nonprofit when it comes to uh, trying to change things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're highly organized, and they've, they've created a big impression, and they're very present in the mind. We talk about animal protection, um, pets or pets, or, um, have a, as you just pronounced it, it's, it's the one that comes to mind. Yeah. Um, and so, and I think, you know, uh, when this conversation was sort of ahead is sort of the necessity to be contextually relevant to the audience that you're trying to reach, which is what you've been doing. Yeah, yeah, because also, again, what I do appreciate with, with Peter, again, for Peter, is that, again, that mm -hmm. you can, everyone knows about them. 
they do manage to get their message across, but also manage to get things done legally uh, with the government pretty much. So it's 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 a super smart way, kind mm-hmm. of how they do it, and that's kind of what I've, uh, I guess, a bit noticed, kind of in the non. Not all nonprofits, of course, uh, but you know, mm-hmm. kind of in in the American American nonprofit space, where there mm-hmm. seems to be wanting to more make more noise mm-hmm. rather than trying to come up with solutions in America specifically, because I feel like in the rest of the world it's different. You know, in the UK and even in France, you know, coming from Europe, so mm-hmm. that's what I think is one big uh, problem which we have in the US, and that's why with the light in the darkness, the project is not to make noise. It isn't. Mm-hmm. It's actually to try and create a solution for Holocaust education and also for to you know to stop the rise of anti-Semitism. So it's kind of like two things at once. Mm-hmm. Even and it's even and nearly turned into more things. It has how it's actually resonating with people all over the world of different ethnicities and continents. So it's kind of taken a life of its own now. It has. Well, that's when you know you've created something powerful. But you had quite a journey um, in in creating a game, and it's you know the video game industry is a little like the film industry. It's tough, and it's tough yes. to get attention to your game, and it's tough to get the resourcing and the belief and and, every, and the marketing that something needs. Um, but you know the, the concept you began quite some time ago. Uh, imagination is the only escape was yeah that was when i was like 21 and it wasn't exactly let's put it this way looking back on it now and i'm 37 i'm like mm-hmm. thank thank god i didn't get to make it because i didn't mm-hmm. think i would have made something as good as i did now but the reception back there was interesting it was very divided it was it was pretty much mm-hmm. half were like this is a good idea half were like what the hell are you thinking pretty much and it wasn't just me, so I kind of paused it. I did. Mm-hmm. Then some other game developers even had tried doing things like that. Um, I remember very much there was this uh, Israeli kid who pretty much tried to mod Wolfenstein and make it where he's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like people inside the camp taking revenge on the Nazis. Mm-hmm. It's fictional, it is. But then you had like big organizations kind of go after him and shame mm-hmm. him and everything. And like I said publicly, I would have gone and talked to the kid because mm-hmm. in his mind, he was like, I'm not making anything different than Inglorious Bastards. Yeah. And which is kind of true because film can get away with that. And again, you know, kids and young people, they they have different ways of processing kind of their history and what they want mm-hmm. to see and this and that. And so, so basically what I, I think is one of the, worst things that happened to video games was how because of the fear of of doing anything about the Mm -hmm. holocaust no one did it and i think Mm -hmm. that's actually worse than say video game doing it in not great taste but at least acknowledge it happened during world war Mm -hmm. ii and then we can kind of go from there and make better things off of it so i think that really set us back years not just in the video game space but i think uh kind of in pop culture as a whole Mm -hmm. But mm-hmm. very much, I have very strong feelings about that. No, I mean, and please express strong feelings. I mean, I've, I've read a lot of interviews with you in sort of preparation for this discussion, and there were a lot of striking things that came out from reading that that are obvious when you read them, um, and, and somewhat worrying. Um, you know, we've we've had World War II in video games uh, for a long time, but there's been, and the Nazis have become sort of the the symbol of, of universal evil. Um, but there's no presence of, of the Holocaust and their atrocities in those games, which, when you look at it, seems really absurd that you can make a game um, about you know killing Nazis and, and whatever else, but to have that complete omission of, of their atrocities eliminated from those games is really bizarre because that's the evil that they're known for, but we don't talk about the evil that they're known for. Um, and that's really profound, just how accessible it is to call somebody a Nazi and how difficult it is to talk about um, you know, well, those I, atrocities. I, I would even say, because of the way pop culture has turned Nazis into kind of these uh, stereotypical, nearly fantasy-like villains, right? Mm. People in America don't even understand what Nazis kind of are anymore. So, you know, mm-hmm. quote, they will call anyone a Nazi. They will, like, how... um two times like in the past two weeks you know how they've discovered pretty much 
there's some people with Nazi tattoos or lots of them coming mm-hmm. out, right? And lots of people are like, but they're not white skinned. How can they be a Nazi? And then the press, the media is often saying white supremacist. And mm-hmm. in Europe, after World War II, in Europe, we weren't really calling Nazis white supremacists. We were calling Nazis Nazis. So I think mm-hmm. even the way the media has distorted it, it's made it when no one can understand Nazis anymore. And if you don't understand Nazis, you can't fight them. You can't very yeah. much. Or you can't combat their ideology because their ideology mm-hmm. was very... It was completely absurd. <laughs> Honestly, all their race science was completely absurd. We all know. Mm-hmm. But there was small things like they thought Turkish people and Iranians were also part of the Aryan race. So mm-hmm. it wasn't just Nordic, blonde, white people. They also considered English people to be part of the Nordic race, but they didn't like English people because, you know, they were at war against them. France, mm-hmm. they thought Northern France was Aryan. South France, Mediterranean, not Aryan. So it's kind of like... It was kind of like a Nordic supremacy uh, thing mm-hmm. which was going on with Nazis. And that's like, um, I think America has to really understand that in order to understand why so many, how can I say, diverse groups are becoming mm-hmm. more Nazi-like. Because even during World War II, the Nazis were actually quite diverse at, at, at times, which I know sounds super weird. And I think it's, again, it's because of pop culture, it's because mm-hmm. of even media and things like that. Mm-hmm. And that's what I think I'm trying to kind of change is to educate people about those things because I do actually see in America, I mean, I see a rise of Nazism ha- happening in, in America. And in Europe, we can notice it right away, we can, and we know yeah. what it is. But America, because they don't understand it, mm-hmm. they keep on just being shocked by it every single time. And and, mm-hmm. and that kind of talks to how you have these anchors and journalists who don't understand that, it mm-hmm. kind of talks to how possibly Holocaust education in the US, mm-hmm. I'm saying possibly because you can't do every single state, is yeah. absolutely broken. And it and it, mm-hmm. I've had educators at museums tell me it's broken. It is in the wow. United States. So it's very common. Not many people come out publicly about it because, you, you know, if, if you have a job, right, and mm-hmm. you're doing your job and you're like, by the way, we completely fucked this up. <laughs> you know, it's kind of, it might be a bit hard to get extra funding and things like that. But it is very broken. It, it is in the United States. I think that's a, a fundamental problem that we have with a lot of, um, a lot of projects that are uh, meant to deal with, with social issues or is that, there will be a high degree of, of failure. It is learn and, and innovate and repeat. But if we can't take lessons learned and say, this is what we did right and this is what we did wrong and be open about that and have, have typical, typical conversations and we're going to keep repeating the same mistakes because we're afraid, afraid to admit we made a mistake and we're not going to progress anywhere that's useful or meaningful. Um, and I see this in a lot of a lot of different fields in the development space, the NGO space, um, you know, in terms of you know the military and after action report, nobody really steps up and says, you know, we got thirty percent right, so we was wrong. But this is how we're going to fix the other seventy. Um, yeah, because because actually, because actually talking about that, so one of the most successful things in Holocaust remembrance was, was mm-hmm. Schindler's List. Mm-hmm. Schindler's List actually changed everything. So survivors also were able to talk about it after Schindler's List. It became part of pop culture. Museums were able mm-hmm. to get funded. Like, it changed everything. And I I guess instead of kind of, you know, decided to see Schindler's List and being like, this works really well, mm-hmm. you know, people just went the opposite, where it's like, we have to get people to, to remember the exact numbers, the exact camps, this mm-hmm. and that. You don't remember these exact statistics. When we took the human element out of it, we did. Because mm-hmm. what Schindler's List does so well, no matter... If you like the film or not, I think I loved that mm-hmm. film. Is that it showed the human element of everything and it got you to care. So by the end of the film, if you were even kind of you yeah, either didn't care about Jews, maybe slightly anti-Semitic, after that film, as an audience member, you would not want to be like one of the Nazis. You'd be like, oh yeah. boy, I'm not I don't want to be one of those guys, <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. I mean, they even noticed that when they started showing it inside uh different neighbors which had no clue about the holocaust mm-hmm. after those neighbors were like holy shit we did not know what 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 jewish people went through mm-hmm. and 
so that's kind of what I mean. That's the kind of thing. Entertainment and storytelling have always been the most powerful tools to get kind mm-hmm. of society to change. Politicians use it. Religion uses it. Everyone mm-hmm. uses storytelling. And I think pretty much out of Holocaust education, we've taken so much of the humanity out of the 6 million people that died. We don't tell mm-hmm. their stories. We don't mm-hmm. say who they are. Like, it's just we show a bunch of dead bodies and mm-hmm. we're like, Nazis bad. They did this. We don't explain these people's lives. We don't. We don't explain. Mm-hmm. Even if it's something as simple as being like, I don't know, like Moses, uh, Carpenter, things like that, pretty much mm-hmm. had a family, you know, da, 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 then mm-hmm. he ended up dead for no reason other than his race, pretty much. Mm-hmm. It gets people t- to care a lot more because we do hear these numbers nonstop, mm-hmm. of constant war, this and that, and it kind of desensitizes people. And I think that's why, like, for example, like the case of Ukraine, right, why Ukraine has also been uh very successful in terms of people paying attention to it is because mm-hmm. we're for, for the first one of the first times in history because of twitter we're seeing like ukrainians kind of tell their mm-hmm. stories of, of what is going on so you that's why i think a lot more people are really caring about ukraine compared mm-hmm. to other wars where they'd be a lot more detached from it so even if you see a lot of bombing right and if it's just the bombing without the human element that's kind of when you know i think you can't get the audience pretty much. And that's just human nature. I, I absolutely agree with you. I, I tended to call it um, almost an accounting of violence. This many dead, this many maimed, this many wounded, and there's nothing human to it. And so, you know, in, in these, you know, difficult, catastrophic, violent situations, it's so incredibly important to preserve the story and, and the identities of, of people that are affected by by violence or you know, um, the, you know, the Nazis were an industrialized form of violence. Um, but without those stories, as you say, they're just numbers and there's no empathy with a number. And empathy yeah. is, is what will prevent the violence happening again, not the statistics. Yeah, because even something just as simple like in France, right? So in France during the Holocaust, uh, you kind of had a divided country, you did. So mm-hmm. basically the that and jewish people were a lot they were a lot more accepted compared to the rest of europe they are french citizens they were like yep. france made it very everyone is french under the law since napoleon times mm-hmm. and so french people they were a lot more integrated actually even with french people and all that and that's how come most 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 a lot of them even pretty much when they managed to flee the occupied zone mm-hmm often they could find shelter more than other countries, pretty much. And it came more from, dare I say, not like working class, poorer people, pretty mm-hmm. much farmers, things like that from villages who would hide people more. They don't mm-hmm. have righteous among the nations awards, anything like that to them. It's just like, well, helping another French person. What the hell is going on? You yeah. know, they didn't think that way. While the kind of elites and rich people in France were very anti-Semitic and they're very highly educated. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's, again, a very interesting thing that people don't quite seem to understand, even with anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism came a lot, even in Europe, came from the mm-hmm. universities, the highly educated people, the people in power. So sometimes just getting people more educated about things doesn't make them more empathetic, it doesn't. Mm-hmm. I mean, the mm-hmm. Nazi scientists were doctors. <laughs> they were yep. some of the worst of people course. around. And... If you, if you look at it again, like this, not not simple people, but, you know, I, I'm, I come from the countryside, so I guess I'm OK to say, but, you know, people more like where I come from, like the farmers, those types had mm-hmm. a lot more nearly empathy and, and care for their fellow citizens or even fellow human beings than the more educated people did. And that's why I think, you know, again, with, with the Holocaust, right, if you if you tell an anti-Semite or a Nazi how mm-hmm. successful the Nazis are, I don't think that's going to change his mind. Instead, he's going to yeah. think, wow, this is actually, this is good German work. That, so <laughs> that's why I think while, you know, if you do show, I mean, it's hard neo-Nazis, you know, but if you do show a more human element or even there's been even cases like, I know some Jewish people actually befriended some Nazis and they were announced mm-hmm. being Nazis after. And again, it's because of the kind of human element of them kind mm-hmm. of realizing like, why am I hating this group of people for no reason? And, and that's why, and that's why I even think um, 
even the film American History X kind of really shows mm-hmm. that how that guy pretty much goes to prison and then just realizes how wrong he is. And and that is mm-hmm. actually as as the main one thing people don't want to admit, but the most successful cases where we've actually been able to make groups get along mm-hmm. is actually even for them to even like have dinner together and actually talk mm-hmm. and actually meet more people. And that's why people inside cities in general in America, right, mm-hmm. will be less racist than, than people mm-hmm. that aren't from big diverse cities because, you know, who've never seen other groups mm-hmm. and therefore become more racist. That's like I'm saying entertainment allows us to bring that to those people because, again, they can't meet everyone. They can't. Mm-hmm. I think there's something very powerful in that. A friend of mine made a documentary um, about uh, uh, Palestinians and the Israelis having an ayahuasca ceremony together. Um, really? They, 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 yes, she did. She's a very famous uh, documentarian. And she said everybody cried together and couldn't understand the violence and you know, toward each other. But there is a, you know, when we get to that level of understanding people, there is, you know, we, we can find our humanity in each other um, and we can overcome these things. Well, that, um, and that, it, it is empathy that does it. I mean, that's actually interesting because I remember I remember watching the film Oslo um, mm-hmm. about Israel Palestine, how a bunch of professors and people try to negotiate everything, and they brought them up to this castle, and how in that film you had them basically first both all fighting and hating each mm-hmm. other, and then kind of after a while because they were stuck in this castle together and having to figure out everything, that she started mm-hmm. to see the humanity in each other and how mm-hmm. much they actually have in common. And, and I think even to the cause of the Israel-Palestine conflict, because funny enough, I'm in Los Angeles and I spent like the end of the year pretty much, I went over to, to Christmas thing, mm-hmm. and pretty much as a Palestinian, there was an Israeli, there was who had mm-hmm. been in the IDF and everything. And everyone just all kind of getting along pretty much when it was, you know, taken outside of, mm-hmm. you know, you know, conflict zones and kind of more people in power trying to divide uh, yeah. everyone pretty much. Because that's one thing which I've kind of noticed in regards to Israel, Palestine even, because I follow both sides, I do. Mm-hmm. And on Twitter, I see, this what I call them propagandists on both sides mm-hmm. who basically say the worst things and dehumanize each other. Yeah, And I'm just like, you guys are the spokesperson for both groups. What the what on earth is is, is kind of wrong or going on here? And I think this this again because both groups are kind of have a lot of funding. They do pretty much by mm-hmm. human rights mm-hmm. organizations, and I'm like, mm-hmm. you're both employing racists. <laughs> you are so, and that's again shows kind of division and nearly what I've noticed in a lot of uh, how can I say. Uh, Things for fighting uh, kind of human mm-hmm. rights for certain ethnicities, right? At nonprofits, is mm-hmm. that a lot of the time they s- turn so racist towards other groups, pretty much, is what I've noticed. Mm-hmm. Like, it's and I'm not yet to... at the what? It's, it's adversarial, not not around yeah. resolution. Um, There's no solution, and... pretty much. Yeah, it's, it's, and when we see this, you know, these are the difficult conversations that we need to be brave to have because we're seeing the negative effects um, on society when there are many valid grievances on the basis of race uh, around the world, uh, many valid reasons to have grievances of, of colonialism. Um, but we need to be able to, not so much safe space, but we need to be able to address grievances and remove fear. Because when the grievances are put forward, the other group, or historically their ancestors may have been responsible for it, then feel threatened themselves, and we're into adversarial communication. Um, and, and lions harden and lions form, and we don't go anywhere. And, we need and to then have it ends up in, in more conflicts, it ends up in more... Because mm-hmm. that's also kind of, kind of what I've noticed, too. Like, you can have groups, pretty much, that can be as oppressed by X group, they can, mm-hmm. and then... Like, say, for example, like the German, ethnic Germans in Eastern Europe who mm-hmm. weren't Nazis, who actually had lived there for generations mm-hmm. after World War Two, I mean, Eastern Europe basically, like, sent them off, took their property, kicked them out, created mm-hmm. lots of trauma on these ethnic Germans who had nothing mm-hmm. to do with the Nazi regime. And, you know, they actually, in some cases, actually killing some. And I think this this is, again shows how you know the aftermath of World War II and the Holocaust it didn't end um, 
mm-hmm. it didn't end it didn't like hate was still going throughout europe and all those things and yep. i think it's very much like what have you noticed today is that people tend to blame entire groups or citizens of a country for their governments and things like that mm-hmm. and especially in america which kind of makes me laugh a lot because i'm like mm-hmm. hey america you remember the iraq war you did so it's kind of like america or americans you're in no space to kind of you know kind of dictate people on what to do but also no one mm-hmm. should hate a random american or the iraq war so it's kind mm-hmm. of like we need to be more like that because like in the case of let's say for example iran right mm-hmm. I've, I've me personally i've put on a personal level mm-hmm. i've never met an anti-semitic iranian but mm-hmm. the government is arguably the most anti-semitic government in history in not in history mm-hmm. but currently in the world so this yeah. again shows how much a government does not necessarily represent the people yeah no, that's absolutely true that a government doesn't reflect <clears throat> You know, although we see the democratically voted, the way that you know the, the, the parties operate, the two party system, the limited number of choice, um, that it's certainly not representative of all the beliefs of uh, of the people um, at all. And you know this idea as well that we 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 hear the phrase "never again" um, around the Holocaust, um, but we. See we see violence proliferating around the world that could easily turn, you know, we had uh, genocide in Rwanda. Mm-hmm. Um, we've had, we've had events, we've had these things. And the moment that we need to understand what the indicators are that can lead us to a position where we can see the systemized use of violence against ethnic groups um, with, with genocidal intent and, and find a way to decelerate violence and, you know, that's what I found really exciting about what you were doing because I, I was, you know, reading your tweets um, and, you know, it, it just clicked for me one day was that films like Schindler's List and American History X is another, is a great example. It's a very scary film in many respects, yeah. American History X. Uh, it's brutal, uh, but powerful for that is that you know, films can, you know, you're in a cinema and stock can kind of bring you the story, but a game, you make decisions in a character, you're in their shoes, it's it's more personal in a different way. And to me, it was like, wow, that is such a great medium to enable us to have empathy that would be inaccessible otherwise. And that's what really got me you know, excited in, in learning about and, and looking into what you've done with the, the light and the darkness. Well, I, yeah, well, that's what I think is the power kind of a video games that kind of, in my opinion, like the future of storytelling they are, mm-hmm. and they do allow people to be more emotional in connecting to it. Because anytime someone has streamed the game, they pretty much at the end just end up crying, uh, mm-hmm. the poor players, but they're pretty much just completely in tears. And I think that really speaks to how uh, powerful video games can kind of be. Mm-hmm. And and also another thing which I've noticed too um, with the video games is it's kind of they they appeal really to all audiences and all ethnic groups kind of around the world. So that's again like when I had like uh, an African very much from the Zimbabwe very mm-hmm. much write to me and tell me that she saw herself in these characters. Wow. You know, even if it's set in Europe, and she'd explain mm-hmm. to me why. And so that really showed kind of the power of it pretty much and so that's that's why i think a lot of um again a lot of people like and that's why i release it also worldwide because Mm -hmm. um you know i think pretty much we focus so much on the holocaust awareness in the west we do but now we're connected worldwide we are and i think it's also to kind of think that worldwide won't be more interested i mean case of africa there's Mm-hmm. There's been so many genocides. So of course, people want to learn more about this and kind of how it happens. I mean, that's why also a lot of uh, survivors of African genocides do things with Holocaust survivors and kind of mm-hmm. look at, at to how Holocaust survivors talked about their stories to kind of, you know, do something similar, you know, so they kind of take inspiration from it. So, so that's why I do think, again, talking about Holocaust, it's not just talking about the Holocaust, isn't it? It's also talking about, you know, 
how society can get that way super quick. Because also with The Light in Darkness, since it's set in France, Mm -hmm. France was arguably, I would say, was America, of course, the best country for Jews. It really was. Mm -hmm. They even had, they were giving citizenship to, they were Mm -hmm. colonizing areas, but to Sephardics, they're giving them citizenship. They were. So they wanted Jews like over in their country. Mm -hmm. But within a matter of years, they went, to commit a genocide and it shows how quick it went because with nazi germany you saw it coming it was coming Mm -hmm. pretty much you had a lot a time to see it coming you did with start off in mein Kampf. you had the time to see Mm -hmm. but in france it just happens so quick it's just a matter of a few years and it shows how fast the government can kind of turn that way and how Mm -hmm. even fast people can turn that way who aren't necessarily like that and this again speaks to propaganda it speaks to several other mm-hmm. things and that's why i think france was also such an interesting thing to do because again it wasn't the nazis that rounded them up it was the french mm-hmm. police so also again making nazis so fantasy like you know mm-hmm. kind of like cartoon villains but nazis were just honestly just everyday people they were mm-hmm. and the french government pretty much did the same thing as the Nazis, only they weren't Nazis. So it shows mm-hmm. how that ideology can kind of spread it can, and people can do kind of similar things. Because I guess that's one thing which maybe we do miss out a lot, is that, again, retreat Nazis and just say bad guys mm-hmm. in general, like uh, stereotypical superhero villains, rather than just realising mm-hmm. they're human, I nearly not any human but a lot of humans can turn that way so we've Mm -hmm. got to look at okay how do we prevent society from becoming that way again because with with the right propaganda and everything we say never again i am yeah it could happen again on on another industrial scale Absolutely, it could happen again and it's you know it's it's as you said it's the propaganda it's creating structures that are dehumanizing it's creating rule sets and processes that, that people can be obedient towards. Um, and we seem to have drifted so far away from the values that were enshrined in the United Nations charters after. Oh, yes. Um, we, we've, you know, we've, we've let these things become um, almost tools of international relations and circumstantial and eroded um, what was supposed to be these, you know, these barriers that, you know, the 198 countries signed up to. To protect ourselves really from our worst selves um and it feels like politics right now is appealing to the worst self and that's the part that scares me well politics if you look at history repeats itself and if we don't study history enough and kind of know really what happened and why we keep on repeating those Mm -hmm. same mistakes it's a bit like how So, you know, again, thinking more people being connected with social media might make the world better. Instead, it's made us more divided, (laughs) it has. (laughs) It's made us more divided, like kind of more, again, not quite. We were always racist. The world is always racist, always has been, always will be too. But now you kind of see this kind of all out in the public open kind of for everything. And I think this creates more groups, more tribalism it does. Mm -hmm. Um. That's that's what's funny. So but basically, politicians and everything thought video games would be the thing that would, might destroy society, and instead, it's actually humans and social yeah. media. <laughs> Pretty much, it has because because if anything, if if there was, I'm not saying kids should do this, but if there was more people just busy playing video games, you know, mm-hmm. we probably would have, uh, you know, a society that kind of fights. Um, Less we would because because even when you see internationally, like when I've been to international esports things, it's, it's kind mm-hmm. of a great experience because you have people from all different countries. It's a bit like the World Absolutely. Cup, you know, it kind of brings yep. people together. Yeah. And I really like that. I, I do like this. There's no barriers of, you know, no one's thinking about race, this and that. It's all like mm-hmm. they're here to watch the game. And that's again why I think video games are so powerful. So what was the process like of making them in the light in the darkness? So it's, I started it maybe, I think, yeah, two years ago, uh, pretty much. And um, so this time it was really basically kind of getting all the facts right. So being mm-hmm. very historically um, accurate. So 
I worked pretty much also at the start, you know, I had a bunch of people consulting on it with me. Mm -hmm. I did pretty much, but then what we kind of noticed that not everyone was getting everything right very much yeah. because even me who because I'm kind of an obsessive person so I don't mm -hmm. trust anything I see I have to check it like three times pretty much and I noticed there's a lot of things which weren't entirely correct just dates kind of things like that mm -hmm. and these were kind of often sometimes from people who were historians so mm -hmm. I to, which made it kind of even a bit more troubling but again Holocaust is so vast so you can't get everything mm -hmm. right all the time you can't so we really had to actually do our own research we did which nearly took us i'd say nearly like a whole year nearly mm -hmm. so wow. that includes like journalists so there's this great journalist at france 24 uh stephanie mm -hmm. Troyard. she just she's probably the most knowledgeable person about the holocaust in france and she's a journalist and they did so many great articles then the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum in D.C. was super useful in terms of they mm -hmm. have all the documents up all on their website and then they allow people to use them because they kind of no, have no copyright use. Mm -hmm. So and then combined with Yad Vashem too. So kind of basically from the Internet and having all these the best three resources were pretty much, like I said, U.S. Holocaust Museum, Yad Vashem and France 24. So mm -hmm. Yeah, we basically spent like a whole year and a, and a bit with the Shoah Foundation too, like um, going for a lot of survivor testimonies, things like that, mm -hmm. which were, they were more, those survivor testimonies were more good for the small anecdotes, kind of like small stories of things which happened pretty mm -hmm. much. Like during one scene in a camp, for example, uh, Moses sees Jacob, who's one of his friends, mm -hmm. and, you know, Jacob had vanished for a while. So he asked him, where were you? And Jacob is pretty much like, well, we went to the countryside, so a bunch of people hid us, but then after a while, they're like, you have to leave. So we just mm -hmm. went back to our apartment pretty much in Paris. And that comes from a story that mm -hmm. actually happened, which sounds absurd, right? But it actually happened. So that that is what the show Foundation was uh, useful for, because kind of majority of things that take place in the game are kind of based on things which mm -hmm. happened pretty much. So it's kind of a combination of so many different stories into one. So it was really that that took basically a long time. But what I noticed kind of by doing that is when I talk to other developers who are making games about the Holocaust, mm -hmm. I tell them, do your own research, triple check it. You don't necessarily need the Holocaust historian on mm -hmm. your project as long as you triple check and you're making sure you get all the facts right. Mm -hmm. And of course, use correct resources like Yad Vashem and the U.S. Holocaust Museum. Mm -hmm. uh, because again, it, it you know, because there's such a barrier of entry to be able to do these kind of projects, because mm -hmm. for even uh, an organization, museum, or uh, even anything that funds anything, you, they want historians on it, they do, and which mm -hmm. I think is very limiting. It mm -hmm. is, and again, I actually do love historians. So it's, it sounds like I'm bashing them, but it's just, it was so hard for us to mm -hmm. get people on board with the project that's like i kind of have a different mentality now where i'm like it's going to be hard for even i think future developers too so it's come just kind of do your own thing even if it has changed since the launch mm -hmm. it was quite um a hard process to actually make this game no i mean it's it's an amazing you know an achievement that you've done and i think that i think to my impression of what you're saying is the you know, I find the experience of reading history and accounting of events, not in the same way um, as, you know, an accounting of violence as numbers, but it, it tends to be very factual, almost investigative. This person was yeah. here, this person did that. But what it doesn't often have is the experience of what happened, um, which is the powerful part, because you know, there's quite a lot of touching things, um, you know, in, in the light and the dark, you know, with the, um, you know, the relationships uh, between the characters, they're very, they're very human and, and you, you feel and empathize with them. You feel the situation getting darker around them. Um, and you, you know, you feel, you know, um, you know, the, the talking about the discussions about, you know, bravery and the confusion and the child trying to understand what's happening. Um, these aren't, you know, the, the work of a historian, these are, 
the stories of people who lived it. And that's a, there's a difference there that's very important. Well, I, and I also think like one of my favorite characters, uh, his his name is Bernard, but it's originally Miss o, Miss I can't pronounce it mm-hmm. Miss Oed because it's a Algerian name. It is so he's basically a Sephardic Jew from Algeria, but in order to uh, integrate in France, he just became mm-hmm. super French and super secular. So mm-hmm. he's kind of a bit of a the comedy character for most of the game, where he's just like, you know, keeps on falling in love every two seconds, keeps on being dumped. Mm-hmm. He keeps on eating pork. He does. He doesn't mm-hmm. care. Like he, he even converts to Christianity at one point. You know, he's he's quite absurd. But even the converted to Christianity thing was to show because there was a lot of Jews who actually did did become Christians and they were mm-hmm. still killed in the Holocaust because it was a race based mm-hmm. genocide. And again, mm-hmm. in America, a lot of people think it was a religious based genocide, which it wasn't. Mm-hmm. And so that again was to kind of show that aspect. But also with Bernard. Was kind of had this character because you know the family's a bit more serious, right? Which is kind of quite lovable and a bit mm-hmm. of an idiot, right? Oblivious to everything, which makes people care a lot more when actually things really happen to him. And I mm-hmm. think that that's again kind of, because if you, if you if you look at it, just um, you know, I think even when you try and present like perfect characters, like in mm-hmm. in film and kind of things like that, like it's. You know, it's you again. You're moving out their humanity. That's like I'm gonna have like the parents arguing about things. Like mm-hmm. Moses is honestly mm-hmm. kind of an idiot for like you know staying and not listening to mm-hmm. his wife and thinking trust the government. The government's good. This is a great country. Or even how you have inside um, the PTV camp, you have uh, Jacob who who's a Zionist, right, mm-hmm. and Moses who isn't a Zionist, mm-hmm. basically debate about Zionism kind of things. So that those things were actually again happening. They they mm-hmm. were very much during those times, which is again one thing which we don't mention a lot, you know, because you did have a lot of um, the Jewish resistance in France who were mm-hmm. Zionists. They were because they were kind of like this is why we need to go back to you know that area pretty much and mm-hmm. have our own state but again with um and and the same thing is when i'm showing these things i'm not taking either side i'm just like this is no. discussions that happened these these are actually so people need to kind of know and um even the fact that i'm showing you know refugees basically being mm-hmm. closed out so it so shows so many different things which and i think that's what the times even mentioned too is that most um most films don't mention what we're kind of mentioning like Mm -hmm. again the refugee situation talking just a bit about how zionism was like all those different things you know films really get you know they like to portray things where it's more like oh america great kind of thing Mm -hmm. you know or the allies fantastic what i'm kind of you know just from the first scene uh i'm pretty much really showing that the world closed its doors on refugees mm-hmm. and kind of look what happened. And that's why I think it's um a lot more powerful and nearly a different kind of uh, Holocaust uh, story, which we're actually telling, which, and even if it's been done in film so many times, we're just actually mm-hmm. telling something which is brand new and dare I say, even more, um, more realistic because mm-hmm. it, it's, it's not... Because even in the choice, like most films, they often have a Nazi villain, right? They do. Mm-hmm. And I decide to not have any villains. So there's no villain character there isn't. Because kind of the quote unquote, the evil is basically society. It's the government. It's society. It's kind of like, it's a combination of things it is. And if you just put, how can I say, just one bad guy, right? People mm-hmm. may just think it's that simple. Like, again, mm-hmm. everyone, like the whole series, you know, or sci fi series, a lot of people do often when they're like, if you could go back in time and kill baby Hitler, you know? <laughs> yeah, that trope. Yeah, that, that, that trope. And I'm like, and I'm kind of a believer where I'm like, I don't know, man. I don't know that ideology was, he was rising. I, he didn't single handedly create all of these things he did. Yeah. So, so that, that's again what we're showing. Um, very different. It's a different kind of uh, storytelling. It is. I think it's it's a I think it's a very important approach because you, you're giving the, the the broader context of things, you know. And it comes back to that statement of how do we how do we arrive at this position? How did we get here to this terrible place? And the idea that we can attribute 
um, a circumstance to a single individual for being, you know, responsible for, for these things. It takes a, a series of events. It takes, um, you know, economic pressures, social pressures that get exploited perhaps by a single person, but there's a ground level of resentment or something that's compelling people to do the unthinkable and the terrible. Um, I mean, you've had a lot of great media reaction um, to the to the work, um, which is wonderful to see. How has that been for you? Well, that's actually what's been, I don't feel as aware about it. Like I'm not even excited or disappointed. I won't be disappointed for mm-hmm. not high negative. But yeah, every single media reaction has been positive. Like even the French embassy in Israel tweeted about it where I'm like, mm-hmm. okay, that means it's good that the French embassy is deciding to tweet this. And so, but it's, it's kind of, it's a big contrast compared to again, how, um, and not all organizations, because I do have a, a, lot mm-hmm. of, a lot of friends everywhere, but how big U.S. organizations have kind of treated me and continue mm-hmm. to be towards me. And it kind of shows, because what a lot of people have told me very much is uh, I'm kind of nearly like a competition to them. I don't think so. I just make mm-hmm. video games. I'm just trying to mm-hmm. change things I am very much. There's also... Bit of a loose cannon because mm-hmm. with Twitter, I just tweet anything which I'm thinking at any moment. <laughs> I will, and so, but I think that really speaks to how organizations care more about their image and more about mm-hmm. things like that, and actually trying out new ideas and kind of things like that. And that's why I think um, we do need kind of a disruption in the space. And I think the game has created that disruption mm-hmm. where I do have museums now actually come and talk to me and like mm-hmm. uh, wanting advice and things like that. So it has opened up a lot of doors. It has too. So I think what it has created is a lot of people do want change. And I think they're noticing that we can actually change things. Mm-hmm. So I do actually have a positive, I just think that there's going to be a positive future out of all of this uh, pretty much. But I also do think as I call them legacy organizations, I don't mm-hmm. think they'll be leading the way. I think it's time for nearly like fresh young mm-hmm. people to be kind of leading with things. Even as I say, I'm like, I can't do all the video games about the Holocaust, you know. So that's mm-hmm. kind of, there's more and more young game developers making these games mm-hmm. and I'm helping advise them, telling them what to do and things like that. Because like I said, there's six million stories to be told. So instead I'm mm-hmm. just encouraging kind of more of these games to be made and things like that and help tame them where they could go to get funding, even if I didn't receive any funding. Since the game has been mm-hmm. successful now, I think they, you know, there can be more openness, hopefully now, towards uh, video games. So I really hope it's actually opened up this medium. Well, it's not just about going where the audience is, where young people, you know, whatever, three billion people play video games, the most half the finest population. Um, but it's what's available through the technology to create experience um, and to tell stories because it's, that's, you know, that's, you know, what we've sort of said, the most powerful changes um, that we see come about from storytelling. And, and as, as you said, when you look at what any religion is, religions are stories of people. Yeah. Um, and that's, we go back to parables of people and challenge. We don't talk about statistics. You know, there's not not the religion of statistics. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, it'd be super, super weird if it's like, this many Jews actually were in the desert with Moses, pretty much like it was so statistical. Mm-hmm. No one would follow Moses' story, just be like, this is really boring, man. Yeah, and there's no there's no humanity, there's no triumph in, in, in those things. Um, you're working on a digital museum at the moment? Is a new project of yours? Yes, yes. I'm working on a digital museum, which is kind of like a side thing. And that digital museum is pretty much to kind of prove that we can make museums digitally for people who don't have access Mm -hmm. to them really cheap and really quick. So that's Mm -hmm. kind of like um, nearly like a side project, pretty much, because I do believe, you know, I do believe that museum should look towards becoming digital because they only service mm-hmm. like a certain amount of people when i look at how much museums cost like 50 million etc cetera, etc cetera, and then mm-hmm. they only serve like twenty thousand people a year i'm mm-hmm. like and then they're forcing students to go there too so it's not even mm-hmm. like people are going to have their own free will uh, that's come out 
maybe some people don't like that because I've, I've I've not been an advocate saying we need more funding in Holocaust education. I'm like, mm-hmm. we need to be spending it more wisely. Very yeah. much. That that's kind of how I feel because we focus so much on cities, so much areas of privilege. Uh, mm-hmm. Dare I say, pretty much. And then we forget about everything. And then, and then in America, we wonder, oh, why is there a lot of neo-Nazis in the South in the countryside? Mm-hmm. Oh, gee, I wonder why. We're so, just not reaching those people. Yeah, not 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 reaching those people. And they've even noticed, too, Florida has Holocaust education mandatory, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Florida, I think, anti-Semitism has risen up so much. Mm-hmm. So clearly, again, it's not working kind of the old methods. It, 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 mm-hmm. It's not. So that's also another thing. And that's why I think digital can change things. Museums, they're great for research. They're great for archives, all those things. I don't think that's that's what's going to stop people being anti-Semitic. I'm more like, hey, digital museums, then if a school can't go somewhere, instead they could mm-hmm. have it digitally. But I don't think that is what will render people less anti-Semitic or care more about the Holocaust. Mm-hmm. I still really believe it's kind of video games of this nature, and not just my game. I just think more and more of these, very much. I mean, I think this. I've never quite got my head around the root cause, but I like to analyze things sort of, you know, quite deeply to understand what it is that's in front of me, in order to be able to kind of um, come up with solutions or, or pragmatic recommendations. But we, we live in a world now where conspiracy theories are mainstream. Yeah. Um, and it feels like anti-Semitism um, or any of these, these beliefs or the Illuminati or anything can basically just metastasize on Reddit and then populate where people are really looking in a way to desperately explain the world or how they feel or why they feel isolated. Or, you know, you look at, where the violence comes from the incel movement for school shootings or for whatever the you know the, the the alienation drivers i guess it's what i'm coming to in the thinking is that there's a, a sense of alienation through political division through negative messaging um through economic pressure and that we talk about the conflation of forces that can create violence we have them and it's just people look for someone or something to blame and the you know, there's there's nefarious and dark forces taking place that are, are leading us down a path with some terrible plan in mind. Um, you know, we're WHO one minute, it's it's um, World Economic Forum the next minute. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and George that, Soros it is it adds in then like But it's in that, I, that kind of setting that, that I see these frightening, you know, that the violence can occur or the guy who murdered his family because he thought they were lizard people. Um, you know, this this crisis of, of alienation. Well, I, I, and I think it's the way we kind of, my, I'm responsible too, because I do amplify it from time to time, but the way we also amplify some things, again, without any solution very much, mm-hmm. it, so that, that, that's how it feels like. Like, say, for example, like on, on Twitter, the recent uh, Elon Musk, uh, uh, George Soros, Magneto thing, so... That yeah, became that. that became really big. Um, my opinion was, I I quite like Maggie to the character, so he's a cool character, <laughs> and I was just like, oh, it's fucking good, pretty much. I, I didn't care about it that much. I didn't, mm-hmm. but you know, it's just amplifying kind of all those things, and everyone is just kind of like, it's bad, but kind of again, not coming up with solutions or explaining mm-hmm. why or emphasizing to people why that's bad and. I think it's, it's 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 again it's becoming like a big outrage um, machine. Very mm, well, much out, with, with everything. Outrage tweets do better. You get more clicks and more shares and more followers when you have outrage tweets. Um, but you know, people like Elon Musk when they make these off the cuff statements, um, and because of his his incredible amount of social influence, and he is a, a brilliant uh, product here. Um, you know, but if People at that level of platform don't speak more mindfully. Um, it, it can have consequences. Well, it's just um, kind of like Henry Ford. Henry Ford, mm-hmm. great car manufacturer, one of the biggest anti Semites who actually, the international Jew, ended up influencing some people who end up working for the Nazis. Mm-hmm. And because he's a very successful man, 
And and that's why I think, it, which is interesting in America, right? I'm actually bringing that up. America mm-hmm. doesn't seem to understand the difference between free speech and hate speech. They think yeah. hate speech is part of free speech. While mm-hmm. coming from France, right? To us, free speech has been like, Macron, we're fucking mad at you. We're going to complain yeah. about Macron every day. It's about going after our government. But the moment, say, for example, you're racist, you get fined because Europe knows the moment you let those racisms happen, mm-hmm. it can lead to something a lot worse. And I've just noticed again with very smart people in the US too, even among Jewish people too, who are like, mm-hmm. no, no, free speech has to happen. Nazis have to be allowed to speak. And even if knowing the history of it, I just look at them kind of in disbelief where I'm like, it didn't work out in Europe that well. Like, Mm -hmm. how Mm -hmm. are you not understanding these things? And I think that's why, yes, we we need to stop. I don't know if I have stop it's America, right? But how they've kind of conflated the two pretty much they have. That's a very simple distinction. Hate speech is incitement to violence against a group. Um, and if hate speech is or, or incitement to limit the rights of individuals um, based on ethnicity, religion, belief, or anything that you can use to separate one group from from another, then we're in the realm of hate speech. Yeah. Um, and that, that's a very clear line. It's not that complicated. If you're looking to cause an act of harm through um, the language that you're using and looking to incite others to join you to limit the rights of others, um, or to expose them to violence. That is a simple act of hate speech. If you want to disagree with an ideology, um, you know, a, go- a government or whatever else, um, and to express dissatisfaction um, with leadership, you know, to, to debate something is different to incite aggression. Yeah. And, and I, it's, I... It's, it's, it's clear to me, but I don't know why other people get confused on that. I don't know. Uh, that's what I mean. Being a European who lives in America, I love the country. I'm a citizen mm-hmm. now, but I, <laughs> they really are like the mad country of the world at times. <laughs> they, mm-hmm. they are. Cause, Cause I do feel like, as I called it, the old continent, we mm-hmm. all kind of do understand this pretty much mm-hmm. uh, very clearly. And I think, uh, and I think after World War II, I think what governments did like Germany, France, I think they were wise to do to mm-hmm. implement these these things i mean it has made us you know for the first for one of the first times in european history i mean not really because it's ukraine now and russia but mm-hmm. you know that's on western europe on western europe mm-hmm. one of the first times in history we haven't been at war for a mm-hmm. long time so it has worked it has and, and even like economic uh partnerships between countries mm-hmm. they work towards peace so that's why i mean people don't always agree with me where I'm like I'm like everyone should do, be like the European Union each continent pretty much to avoid wars but yeah yeah so so it is actually kind of quite um that's what I mean and, and that's what's again interesting when working on a game like this is you mm-hmm. kind of have to understand kind of all these different points you do uh very mm-hmm. much to be able to make a, a game like this because because gr- because really, if you don't kind of understand, you know, how society works, people, this and that, you won't be able to tell the right story. You won't be able to get your mm-hmm. message across. So that's why it is uh, quite more com- complicated. And that's why, again, I, I think, you know, um, you know, not all, but, you know, a lot of Holocaust education, they've really forgotten about a lot of things they have. Or they even don't even talk how anti-Semitism got or how mm-hmm. it eventually led up to this pretty much. Because it wasn't just, it wasn't just, yeah, oh, everything was great in Europe pretty much for hundreds mm-hmm. of years. And it just popped out of nowhere. It, it yeah. happened because society felt okay with it. And it didn't end when Nazi Germany got defeated. So that's like, mm-hmm. I think it's a lot more complicated, nuanced. And I think, you know, it's time to kind of change um, Holocaust education so people are kind of a lot more aware of all those things and again that could mm-hmm. make it more longer more complicated in schools but that could also be the way towards creating a more empathetic uh society well it's, it's to looking you know to looking at how um large-scale organized acts of violence to get ethnic groups takes place you know um 
these things have happened numerous times in the past. I mean, the Native Americans have mm-hmm. suffered tremendously. Um, the, the massive marginalization of an underreported violence against um, uh, the first people in Australia. Um, you know, it's, we need to look at how we can how we end up in these these situations and scenarios. Um, and, but I and think that's great questions. That's also why Martin Scorsese's uh, new film, which he showed a trailer for, mm-hmm. is about Native Americans. I think that is going to be a big shift in American pop mm-hmm. culture, pretty much, because um, it's going to really, we've never quite had a film like that before. And mm-hmm. I think this is actually, because again, it's American, his, it's American history, and Martin Scorsese, he's a proud American guy, he is. Mm-hmm. And I, I think also, that's also another thing. If you love your country, you have to be okay criticizing it and addressing what it's done in the past because you want it to mm-hmm. be better. Because no the country future. is perfect, it isn't. No. And if if we just basically address the past, pretty much it doesn't mean we want the country to be destroyed. I mean, if people want the country to be destroyed, uh, don't listen to them anyway. They're kind of bonkers, mm-hmm. they are. But... You've got to just want a, um, a better future. And that's, that's why I think, again, case of entertainment, I think mm-hmm. Martin Scorsese, that film, I think that film is actually going to change a lot. It is in America. Mm-hmm. And then so we come back to the power of storytelling and, and the untold stories, the untold perspectives. Because the human experience, we all have the same, um, you know, our bodies are functionally the same. We have the same emotional structures. We all eat, we all breathe, we all suffer. Uh, the ravages of age. So the experience of being human is is universal. Um, and the more that we see ourselves in each other, um, the less reason there is to be scared of each other or the less reason there is to, to create generalized enemies. Although, you know, probably the aspect of generalization is part of how the human brain works. Uh, like you said, we like the idea of a, a simple villain in these things. But that's just not reality. Um, and people are groups of people aren't homogenous. Um, it's not how you know, we have you know, elements of tribalism that come from our millions of years or however long we've you know our evolution. Um, oh yeah, we're very tribal humans in general. We just there, there isn't yeah. one group that's more tribal than the other. Like it's and there isn't yep. like I can tell people isn't one group of people and a group that's more violent, more bad than mm-hmm. the other. It isn't because we can look at any moment in history and we see mm-hmm. every group has kind of done bad things sure. that's that. all capable yeah so, so i think that really shows again like how much more we again have in common and that's why again with light and darkness like how it's actually appealing to so many people yeah. that is which is something again interesting because when I was trying to get funding for it, a lot of people were like, what's your target audience? And I was <laughs> I was kind of like, oh, my God, it sounds so businessy, right? Because I'm, like, mm-hmm. I'm not making a product like clothes or anything or like, or soaps or, you know, something specific. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, I don't care what target audience is. I'm just putting it out. It's for everyone. Mm-hmm. Because the moment you start thinking about your target audience, you kind of, you start thinking that not everyone can resonate with it. So mm-hmm. say, for example, if I decided my target audience is only Europeans, right? Then I mm-hmm. might make something that's all Germans and it's just only mm-hmm. focused towards Germans, it only appeals to them. And that's why I think, again, this is people not understanding storytelling because when you just make mm-hmm. stories, you just kind of see and it just kind of appeals kind of to everyone. I mean, even something as dumb as like superhero films, like mm-hmm. I, I remember like, seen black panther the entire audience was all kinds of people pretty much and we're mm-hmm. just there i you know i remember some racist people like oh, i don't want an african superhero and it's like in superhero we just want to see a cool story within a cool world yep. and that's kind of how most people i believe think that's like um yeah it was a success worldwide because people just want to see or experience stories which they like and you know which they have things in common. i mean even religion mm-hmm. right like story at say christianity jesus i mean you have what korean christians who do pretty much mm-hmm. and jesus is a jew pretty much mm-hmm. and you have you know you've had the entire world pretty much be mm-hmm. able to follow and really like that story so again that that talks even muslims you know there's all muslims mm-hmm. from all over the world so that again shows you know how storytelling is very powerful and connects people and universal, and universal yeah universal 
and I think you know the that when we see the universality of human experience across different cultures, and in the, in the context of those cultures, because there are there are you know culture is an integral part of of, a lot of, of identity, but culture doesn't need to be a barrier. Um, it can be something welcoming, and it doesn't need to feel under threat of appropriation of these things. But having having you know I guess the, the, the Black Panther representation that is great for the children to be able to see and look up and, and see somebody in their image being a hero, but not just a hero to their community, that everyone went and enjoyed that film. Yeah. So <laughs> that, that's the, the power of these things. Well, thank you for taking the time today. It's been brilliant talking to you. Um, and I can't wait to sort of share this conversation. Um, and congratulations on, on the work that you've done and, and truly taking something that was, you know, as you said, not a, not a, not a game that was easy to put in a box for a, a publisher to understand or a market to understand, but a, a way of storytelling from that's so phenomenally important and the effort and, and courage that it takes to get something out there that hasn't been done before. So, you know, amazing work and you know, thrilled to have you yeah, talk to you. And, and I think pretty much the cool thing is, I think we've proved that it, that it works pretty much. Mm-hmm. That's like I'm, I'm, I'm quite excited to see, you know, what other game developers do now. You've, you've certainly, you know, opened the possibility um, to be able to think differently and, and hopefully to see some of the Remembrance community look at new tool sets and new ways of engagement. Um, as you say, to reach people who, who don't have access to museums who, mm-hmm. physically um, and to, to, to take a storytelling approach that can truly affect us as people. I think that's, that's incredibly powerful. So thank you very much. It's been brilliant to talk to you. Thank you.